Welcome to today's webinar. Hello. It's about automation and integration. We've got an update for you today. You're in for a real treat. It's all about data switch. If that's not what you were expecting, I'd stick around anyway. I think it's going to be a pretty good one. Today, we've got joining us Nick Trevor, who is the product development manager here at Nexus. Now, Nick's been with Nexus for about eight years. He was the product owner of Data Switch. Many of you would have known him as he was running around doing implementations as a consultant, and now he is managing our development team. So he's he's pretty clever in what he does. I I'm Darshni Shah. And I'm the product manager here with Nexus. Now, you know what we look like. You don't need to see us anymore. We're gonna switch off our webcam so you can focus on the content. However, I am gonna be cheeky because this is a webinar where we wanna try and get a sense of where you're at. So before we even kick off, I promise you, there's not too many of these, but I just want a quick poll that I wanna run. And I've got a question for you guys to see if this is your first webinar or you've actually attended one of these webinars before. So you'll see that pop up on your screen. So if you can just start voting, that would be great. And I see the votes flying in. 40% have voted already, over 50. Oh gosh, everyone's voting very quickly now. Excellent. We're almost at the 75% barrier. A few more in. And I'll close that. Brilliant, thanks very much. Good to see, and we've got just under 30%. This is the brand new one for you, so glad you can join us. Happy to have you here. There is a Q&A panel. If you want, go ahead and fire off some questions in there as you think of them. Don't wait till the end. We will have a Q&A session right at the end as well, so feel free to do that. But without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Nick to give you an overview of what we're gonna cover today take you through the update. Thanks very much. Enjoy the day. Thank you, Darshan, for that. So today's webinar is all about data switch, as Darshan mentioned. So very exciting. We'll go into some technical elements of it. So there will be uh, a bit of code shared on the screen. So don't get too uh, daunted by that. But we'll also go through some of the life cycle of the product, where it's up to, what kind of features we're looking to bring in, and how we're adding value to data switch every day. So the first Part of the agenda I want to start with is a few of my own kind of stories with data switch. So go to site and implementing it to solve some business problems. And so I've, I've taken two examples that I have actually done and performed myself, and I'm going to speak you through them. After that, we'll go through the life cycle, and like I say, and then what's coming up next. So without further ado, let's start on our first story. So went to a customer site, and what the aim of well, what the problem was is that they wanted to be able to turn orders into picks as quickly as possible. So this is in the last year or two. This customer wasn't using any other proprietary WMS software or anything like that. They were using just pure CISPRO on this implementation. So what we needed to do is be able to print some form of document as orders were being placed and print them into the warehouse as quickly as possible. So nice, nice simple solution at, at the start. So Let's get the sales staff to allocate stock into the allocate to the bins, allocate the stock. We'll get and get data switch to query the orders that are in ship and within a given ship date. And then we'll use our K3 reports utility to print a dispatch note, which will act as a picking note into the warehouse. Super simple solution as it starts off. So let's have a look at what that kind of looked like in data switch. So really simple, one query into the, into the database to get our picks and then another splitter to then go and create the relatively, you know, to call the K3 reports API to print pick notes. For those that don't know what K3 reports is, it's one of our um, supplementary pieces of software that we offer, which allows us to write crystal documents and we can do a, quite a bit of automation with that. We have done that within the past. It does mean you don't actually end up using the standard CISPRO documentation. We write our own, but it does give us a bit more leeway in terms of what we can automate. So nice and simple solution. We put this down at the customer site. Unfortunately for me, the customer then turns around and says, actually, Nick, this isn't quite what we wanted. 
we actually want data switch to do a lot more than that. Can it can also allocate the stock to the correct bin? And because we need to print commercial invoices and a separate pick note, can it print multiple documents? And by the way, we also credit check when it goes on in ship. So can we just make sure that gets handled? And um, there's a little input, got little, some serials popping around there to handle. And um, because we do intercompany, can the system also pull in pricing information from different companies in the database? So my first solution was way off the mark in terms of handling any of these extra requirements. So as we drilled down and, and put this kind of draft solution in, we realized we need to rethink our processes. So where do we go from there? Okay. First of all, we need to look at how we allocate stock. Now, the sales clerk needs to be able to allocate well, promise stock to a customer as they're taking the order, but they don't know where in the warehouse they're going to be taking it from, whether that's you know, a bulk location, a pick location. So we can't allocate the bins. So th this works well for us when we turn on CISPRO reserve stock because it lets us do just that. So a nice little feature in CISPRO that, I'm not, that was introduced in 7 that I, I quite, quite like, the, I fancy when I do just CISPR only implementations, which allows us to do that kind of thing. And then we're going to get data switch to do all those magical bits in between. And then we still use K3 reports at the end to create multiple copies rather than just a single dispatch note. So let's have a little look what that flow ended up looking like. And for those that are on data switch seven, this will look slightly different to you, but how we build flows in data switch eight onwards is using our flow builder. So this is kind of where it ended up. So you can see a whole lot more complexity has been added now into the flow that you saw before. So first of all, we need to figure out a way to automatically query new orders as they come on. So we use the data switch scheduler for that. This basically runs every five minutes, every 10 minutes, whatever we set it up as, which will then go and query the orders in the database that are satisfying and an set amount of business rules. So that includes um, bank holidays, you know, ship date windows, if there's stock available, if the customer's on hold, if the stock's on hold, it covers you know, multiple iterations of business rules that will ensure that orders aren't released that they shouldn't. The next step to that then is to basically handle the fact that we need to put the order in process. So what this means is that now we've pulled it into data switch, there's going to be, you know, it could be a 30, to two minute delay before this actually gets through the entire process if there's lots of other noise going on the data switch at the same time. So we need to make sure the scheduler doesn't pick up an order that's already been processed. So we use something called in process flags. So now we're adding more complexity into our flows. We then run through that and we've got to create, we're going to call multiple CISPRO business objects in data switch to handle this. So you can see here on my 05 and 10 steps, these are actually allocate the bins to the order. So these go off to SQL and they calculate which, which part of the warehouse the, I need to allocate stock to for these orders. And then we put that against the reserve stock the quantity and then we move it into ship. Okay, now if you remember before, I said the customer also credit checks when it goes into ship. So we're gonna add in even more complexity now that data switch needs to handle. So when it goes into ship, there's a good chance that the sales order goes on to suspense, which means I can't actually print a dispatch note because at that point, the customer has failed the credit check. So we need to do a logical step in there and look that up and potentially email someone from the sales department to go review that order before we release it again. Assuming everything goes through okay, we now then need to go and create the dispatch note in CISPRO. So we'll create that through the business object. This will put it into status five. So not ready to invoice yet, because at this point in time, this customer is using the dispatch note as the picking note. So we don't want an invoice to go through in case there is a discrepancy in the warehouse, which means we're not gonna um, invoice the entire order that's on the dispatch note. We'll only know that after the dispatch, the pick has been processed, in which case the warehouse would update the quantities on the dispatch note. So, Assuming it's valid for picking, we'll create the dispatch note and we'll unset the process so the sales order can be processed with further lines later on. Following that, because of the serialization, we actually allocate the serials to the dispatch note after the fact at this particular site, in which case we actually put the dispatch note on hold. So any dispatch notes on hold mean that a sale number needs to be recorded against the relevant lines. 
So we actually do that through an application builder in CISPRO, and that handles that process. So once all the sales have allocated, we then move, or we then take the dispatcher off hold, which allows it to then be invoiced later on. So again, there's a, that's an extra element of complexity that we've now had to satisfy through data switch all in the background. And in parallel to this, then we're also going to create our transactions or, or, or API calls to K3 reports, which then actually print multiple documents. So through this entire process, we managed to take a brand new order on. The sales clerk is, is none the wise. All they've had to do is reserve stock. So hands off at this point, the system in the background is then in charge of the rest. It's in charge of allocating everything into the gates of the bins, doing all the printing and managing the little nuances in between. So this is then going to print, this then prints a dispatch note, a pick note. And if the customer needs a commercial invoice, it'll also print a commercial invoice in a pack of three to the warehouse printer. And the printing is actually done through a more of a, a, a thick flow, I would call it. You know, it's not actually doing much, it's just calling the API and the complexity is hidden inside one of the other steps um, underneath, which is calling a SQL store procedure. So that's actually then calculating what documents the customer requires and creating the relevant print transactions, which go off to K3 reports to automatically complete that task. So what did this achieve for the customer? So they didn't want, it creates a lot less admin for the sales staff. They don't have to, you know, bring up that pop-up window and allocate bins and move stock to ship if you're using standard CISPRO and trying to do this through, let's say, an audit acknowledgement or even just doing it from the manual dispatch note. So these, the, the sales staff are purely responsible for putting on orders and promising stock to a customer. They don't actually care where the stock comes from and they're able to put it on in a future date, knowing that that sales orders or that pick is going to be released in the three or five day window and um, based on working days as well. So they get all that noise taken away from them. They're focused purely on managing the sales orders going on. It helps automate the printing of complex documents. So again, that, you know, having to you know, use SRS and waiting for documents to render or printing three copies all that's taken away from them. But again, they don't need to worry about any of that. The picks are released throughout the day, which means they're not having, they're, they're constantly being churned out to the printer, which means the warehouse is in constant flow. They're not waiting for a person or you know, a, a warehouse admin to go on and actually release a batch number of picks. So again, we're creating um, you know, a more ebb and flow throughout the warehouse. And what's very important here is it's compliant with business rules. So we are making sure we are releasing picks in the two-day window. We're making sure we're not releasing picks where an order's on suspense. We're managing, we're making sure we're not releasing new duplicate paper pick notes into the warehouse. So this whole kind of flow started at this little initial concept, which is, you know, I want to be able to or, or simplify the flow and print pick list to I want it to manage all of these rules in between. And that's kind of the power of data switch here is that they're able to put a process in which kind of takes all that noise away from the sales staff and let them just concentrate on it, you know, getting orders through the door. So I think that's a really powerful use case. I mean, there's there's two other little bits that I think are also really important to pick up in this particular benefits area is the automation is a key element of it. You've got the right person doing the right job at the right time. You're also on the compliance of business rules, making sure you're only releasing within your credit control as well. So you've got your finance team a lot happier than they would have been. And you've got your traceability, you've got your serialization capture at the right time. You're not having to break any of your business rules. So should you, for example, have to trace that at a future date, you've got all of that captured as well. So lots of little benefits. Now, not everyone needs that, but that's where the flexibility of data switch comes in, add and remove as you see fit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And everything's happening and churning capitally in the background, which is the beauty of it. So, Great example. thank you, Ashley. So I'm going to move on to my second story now. So this is more of a customer approach me and said, uh, Nick, we use Date Switch 7 already, uh, but I want to use Date Switch 8 now. And I just want a, you know, half a day's training on how to call APIs, which is one of the main, one of the big features of Date Switch, or it was at least you know, four or five years ago when we released Date Switch 8. 
that you call APIs. And can you just show me some of the steps? Because we're integrating a new startup business that we've, um, we've created. We're integrating it with Shopify. A lot of the transactions will be done through Shopify, but we need that financial back end in Cispro, uh, churning away, keeping the accounts tidy and doing the, the relevant transactions to the GL. So I said, okay, we can do that with data switch. So like I say, initially the customer then had written a, a, their own C-sharp program. So they spent, you know, a week, maybe two weeks writing this program. And all it did was, you know, poll Shopify, bring new orders down, store it in a table, and then actually use Data Switch 7 to create the orders in Cispro. So they spent quite a chunk of time doing what Data Switch can do natively inside its own custom C-sharp program, which, which, you know, that if you've got the right developers to maintain that, that works well. But as soon as those developers leave, you kind of lose the, um, the ability to change those programs. You can move light on them and it can get a bit scary. And whether it's in data switch, then it's easy to support. There's more of a knowledge base around it. And you've obviously got our support desk and A&I team to help out when you need. So we went to site and we thought, and I, and I well, I trained them on it. I said, okay, let's create a, let's take your application. Let's look at the API calls and let's build that into a flow. And then you can take that proof of concept and apply it to the rest of the rules that Shopify or that you need with Shopify. So this is what I trained them with. So first of all, we, we ran a SQL query, which gets a date because the Shopify report requires to send a date parameter in for, to basically get any new orders past a certain date. So that's the first thing we need to do is record a date into a table somewhere so we can keep storing it and updating that the newest data that we used last. We then call into the Shopify API, which is using the get orders API call. And that brings all the orders down that have been created past a certain date. We then split each of those orders down and then we log it into a table just like his application did. So this, this after a bit of initial training, this actual flow took probably less than an hour to write and to test, write and make sure it's working. So, you know, you've gone from what he potentially took, you know, a week writing the C-Shop application to an hour, basically just building up the same process inside a tool that is easy to support. So that's quite the beauty of it. So I left him, I left him with this flow. I went away and I revisited uh, not too long ago to see how he got on with the whole process. And this is not to scare anyone with what can be done, but this is, this is the customer's own flow and what the solution that they born out of what I've given them as a proof of concept. Yeah, it's pretty big. It does a lot of things, this particular flow, and this is managing a lot of transactions with Shopify. So my measly five steps, which are somewhere there in the left-hand corner, you know, turn into multiple flows. Now, this is, these are all multiple different processes. So what these, all of this actually, actually does with Shopify, it manages the order processing, confirmation, helps allocate stock. It does the invoicing, it also manages the payments with Shopify, posting the relevant GL transactions, cashbook transactions, it even does some of the stock codes or static maintenance as well with Shopify. And one of the worst things that we ever have to do is always credit notes. No business wants to be doing them. So this also manages the credit notes through the Shopify portal. So what, what was half a day's of training with someone who was quite, you know, you know they're, they're a programming mind. They, they wrote their own stuff in the past. They'd used Data Switch 7. They were able to turn into this flow which I think is pretty outstanding because um, it then manages the whole business without the need for any custom C-sharp programs. So what does this achieve? So obviously the customer is able to automate all the transactions with Shopify for a seamless experience. So any customers logging in would be able to get all the information they needed and vice versa, anyone logging into Cispro would be able to see all the Shopify transactions as they needed. So you're creating this complete parallel with the two systems and managing that process. What was also big after this is obviously the customer became self-sufficient at writing their own complex data switch from this point. So they were able to not only do Shopify, but they could have taken that, that knowledge and applied it to anywhere, whether that be intercompany, which they've done a lot of, or it could be even integrated into a Magento or something else. So from a little proof of concept, a bit of training and the customer then going away and, and, and taking that knowledge, they turn it into something much, much bigger 
and data switch was then able to kind of manage that whole business which i think is which is hugely critical for them I think it's interesting because we're seeing a lot more organizations starting to go down the path of e-commerce as well. COVID's accelerated a lot of those digitization strategies. So Shopify seems to be one of the favorite ones that a lot of people are embarking on, but then you end up with a double entry of something that sits in Shopify. How do you get it into Cispro, which is where all of the bulk of the work's being done as well. So I love the fact that um, as scary as that particular process flow looked in Data Switch, it looks like it's actually doing the job. Yeah. It's it's scary because I've it's kind of if you when you split it down into the areas they're actually only like you know, five to ten transactions long but when you put it all together it looks massive but it's doing ten business processes in theory which you know adding that together creates the size of the flow it is but if you split it down into individual groups then it's it's much more easy to comprehend and see the different tasks it's doing and um, in all its simplicity simple is good i love it thanks exactly <laughs> <laughs> right so they're two of my kind of stories that i've kind of just wanted to broach on to show you know you know we can do it for you or you know if you really if you've got the right technical knowledge we can come in and help you train you and as long as you get to grips with dates which you can actually write huge processes that do so much of the bulk of your business processing and, and really really trim down on those, those admin costs so next on my agenda is to give you a bit of a product update on data switch um, so people understand where we're up to and where things are going so let, if we just broach on the product life cycle so people kind of get a bigger picture understanding of where data switch is at as a whole so i'm going to start from the bottom of this little uh, lovely grid i put together data switch seven and below which was i can't I think it was released around 20 2007 data switch seven but we pretty much retired it around 2015 when we brought out Data Switch 8. So that's been retired for some amount of time. Now, obviously, our support desk will help you with queries. They've still got the knowledge to uh, help you with uh, Data Switch 7, but there won't be any product updates. There won't be any changes to Data Switch 7. It is what it is, and that, that's, a, that's a product that's out there, and it's still doing a lot of great things for customers. But the idea is that they have to get people moved on to 8, so people are using the most current release. There was various versions of Data Switch 8 that came after that. So anything version 1, 2, or 3 has been retired. And that moves us into our 4.1 release. So 4.1 was our long-standing release that quite a lot of customers probably in this room are on today. So that came out in 2019. And we've only really patched it since. So that's in maintenance mode. So any you know bugs that come out, any issues like that, will we'll, we'll patch, but we won't be bringing out new features inside 4.1. Again, that is kind of pretty much just, just being maintained for bug fixes. So get on to our most current release, which is Data Switch 8 version 5.54. That is what we brought out in January 2023. I'll speak to some of the features about that today. And that is the release that you can download from the portal today if you really wanted to, um, or you can consult us. And I'll go through some of the upgrade path later on so you understand how you can get on to the latest release. And um, thereafter, we're working on a .55 release, which is due out soon. That's just got some minor fixes in. But our next big, big release is version 5.1. And I'll go through some of the bigger changes in that later on as well. OK, so what's new in our very latest, latest, latest releases? OK, so those who use 4.1, some, some of these changes will, will seem, well, well are quite big a lot of the ui has changed so it'll look slightly it'll look it's familiar very familiar but very different at the same time and you'll understand that as you kind of start to use it so one of the main things that we brought out in version 5 onwards is server side filtering so this allows you much granular level of finding flows without having to use that horrible show top last 100 or what last 1000 rows um, prompt. So this will actually search the entire database. So it gives you a much more grand, well, quicker way to get to the transactions that you want to when you're trying to find something that's happened. So this is a log of everything that's actually happened that data switch has picked up and processed. So all those lovely diagrams we looked at before, each one of those transactions has a little entry in here, doesn't it? 
Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. So and obviously, if you're used, if you've got data switch already, you'll be used to seeing the screen. If you don't, then this is kind of your transactions. These are what the actual reflection of that data flow I showed you before actually looks like when it's being processed. Excellent. So as always, you can you know, right click to maintain. There's multiple ways. There's buttons on the right if you're using a touch screen, or you can right click if you've got a mouse, or you can use the toolbar to maintain these transactions. Occasionally things fail, you might have to push them through. You might have to change the input to a transaction because it might come in with other invalid data. So getting you to be able to make, get a, you know, a system admin who can maintain them is very important for data switch. And obviously the UI needs to reflect and make it easy for that to happen. And it's fully paginated um, based on the server as well. So this is actually paginated paginating server requests, so it's much, much quicker. So I just go through some of them. Like I say, there's no need to show the last X amount of rows like you're used to. So if you, again, if you're used to using data switch seven or any version of eight prior to five, you'd have to, you'd be familiar with that feature. The windows expanded compared to 84.1, so we can show more information. It's multiple ways to transact, as I mentioned, and it's significantly quicker, which is the point where we wanted to get to. There's no waiting around for these rows to load. They come in pretty instantly based on the filters you're putting into the grid, which is really good. Before, it would take quite a while to actually find the transaction because of you know it's got to do basically pull in a thousand rows into the client and then filter it down. We're filtering it down on the server, which is much, much quicker. So we've seen a massive performance increase in actually um, the actual grid itself and maintaining them. A few other things. So the scheduler, which wasn't available in Data 7, it is obviously available in all versions of 8. Um, but there were a few issues with it. So, well, not a few issues. There's a few features that we wanted to add into it as we went along. So one of the things that one of my consultants asked me was, Nick, we keep creating transactions in Data Switch, which do a SQL query. And if that SQL query returns rows, we then process it. But half the time that SQL query comes back with no rows and we keep end up with lots and lots and lots of buildup of transactions inside the process and manager grid, which can create a lot of noise, make it a bit harder to kind of see through, see through the woods. So we actually added in the ability to call SQL directly in the scheduler. And then the return of that will actually bring back the rows into date switch. And if there's no rows brought back, then we wouldn't create a transaction. So this significantly reduces the amount of transactions in the database and it allows us to simplify the flows as well. So we are actually able to take around two steps away from the flows in the database because we're managing at the scheduler level instead. And one little annoyance that you might be familiar with if you are using the schedule already is the cron expression wasn't remembered when you came back in, which meant customers could easily overwrite it if they decided to change it. And um, now it, it does remember it. So when you come in, it, to, it reduces the mistake when you're editing when the scheduler runs. So just little nice little features, um, just worth noting that come in version, uh, in the latest version of data switch. Uh, finally, one of my, one of the things we're working on at the minute and was part of my update that I gave at the customer presentation is, is that we want to improve our third parties call into data switch and give it better access. So the first kind of step in there was to make sure we were compliant with OR 2.0, which sounds really, really boring when I say it like that, but it allows them to use the client grant flow rather than what we use in, which is a deprecated version of the password flow, um, which, we, which you can still use if you want to use the password flow, but it's less secure than the client grant flow that I'm showing you here. So this allows you to create a token for your third parties. And in the future, you'll be able to scope what transactions they can perform on data switch as well. But this basically gives you the OL 2.0 requirement to be able to call in to data switch. So you can get a token from the data switch endpoint and, and that will allow them to then use that token to make requests into data switch, um, which is quite typical of a lot of things um, API nowadays. And I'll talk a little bit more later on what we're doing for version 4, 5.1 to make this even better for third parties. Okay, now one of the, so we've, we've kind of 
had the same let my plugins for a while. Now, a plugin is a you know a, a step. It's something that does something in data switch, whether that's calling to SQL, whether that's send an email, or whether that's you know calling to an API request, uh, or even call a system business object. We've had a quite you know a static library of plugins for a while because we can quite more or less do everything we want in there. But Cispro came around and they finally have introduced the Cispro SRS API, which allows us to print standard Cispro documents from data switch. So what we've built, we've built a plugin for that. So you can now call into the SRS engine to generate a document, which I think is really nice because in the past with Cispro, you had to you know, set up automation tasks. You might have to wait to the evening before customers received invoices. Or you might have to, you know, get your sales clerks to you know, press the button to send it all in lodgement. Perhaps they don't want to press the button, they just want to get onto the next order. So with the introduction of the SRS API, we can now automate some of those tasks. And that's, I'm actually going to go into the product now, show you some of the new features, and we're going to build out a flow that does exactly that. Okay, so I am going to first start inside data switch. So this is my process manager. Josh, you can see that, right? Just make sure you can see my new data switch screen. I can, I can. I see you're in data switch looking good. Beautiful. Okay. So here's my process manager. I can obviously look at my processes that I've gone through today. You can see all my tests. Um, this is kind of where I'm at today. So I want to start quite simply. I'm going to look at what I've got ready to invoice in Cispro. And if I don't have anything ready to invoice, we'll just create an order quickly and dispatch it, get something get ready. So I've already wrote a query, which does that, checks my dispatches and dates, which um, in SQL, which is in state seven. Okay, I've got, I've got no orders at the minute. So what I need to do is go to Cispro, create an order, dispatch it. And then what we're gonna use is the new data switch to create the invoice for that order. So let's quickly go through this. I'm sure many, uh, I won't talk through the Cispro sales on its screen because many people have done this before, but I'm gonna add a line onto my Northern Warehouse for an A100 put it into ship so we can dispatch it and let's just allocate any bins. And there we go, we've got an order. I'm gonna then just print my dispatch note and get that into state of seven. So ignore how quick I'm going through the screens because it's not that exciting adding an order. And let's just print that out now and I'll get a preview in a second of my lovely outdoors company dispatch note. There we go. So we should now have a dispatch note in status seven, which means it's ready to invoice in CISPRO terms. So let's go into data switch and let's create the invoice for that. So I've set up a manual flow and then we're going to actually go back a step and create a fully automated flow that will do this. So just to demonstrate how it works, I'm going to go into adding a transaction manually. I am going to pick up my SRS print and I've got a manual, print invoice manual, and I'm just going to give it a test. And if I just whiz over to my portal, so everything, how to process in data switch is available in the portal. And as is this plugin that we've written. So this is the SRS plugin. There's lots of good information I've written on there to give you how to run it any caveats, any troubleshooting and recommendations of how to use this plugin in the real world. So do have a look at that. Now, to call the particular one I am calling today, I need to use basically a format of this. So this is what the, the SRS API expects. Now I have put this over here, so, and I'll go through this in a second. So I'm gonna copy that into my data switch. So this is a print dispatch invoice. Yes, it's format zero. It's not a reprint. Remember, it's not been printed before. And I need to fill in the filter of dispatch note. So that happens to be dispatch 38 for me to run this plugin. So I'm going to save that as 38 and submit it. Now, that's going to go into in process. So what's actually happening in the background now is if I go back to Cispro, I should see in my document queue. So you can see here, this one that's processing here, invoice. So as that finishes here, we'll notice that it will finish in data switch. So that's gone through now. 
And what that has actually done is it's created me the equivalent of a massive string of characters, which is the equivalent to actually a PDF, funnily enough. So if I have a quick look at the input or output there even. So let's look at the output, sorry. So this is actually what I'm getting back from the API, which it looks like a load of gobbledygook at the start. If I go back into my process manager, I've actually chained this on to a write invoice. So this is actually using our file write plugin. So this is taking that massive string and it's converting it to PDF. And at the minute, all it's doing is dumping it into the file system. So we should see here now 1505, that's when it was created. And there's my lovely invoice for my order. So very nice. So that's what the plugin has now brought me. Okay, so now I want to get quite deep, a bit deeper now. I want to actually automate this flow and build up a, a, a list of tasks. So every time an order, a dispatch note goes in on say a seven, we're gonna invoice it straight away. Rather than having to wait for the evening on a batch invoice run, we can actually send that document directly to the customer as and when we dispatch the order, which I think is, is, is a nice cleaner process and it keeps your numbers churning out throughout the day. So I'm gonna bump into my scheduler and I've got one pre-made as always. And this is my get dispatch notes to invoice. So you can see here, this is my exactly the same query I'm running here to get my list. So it's bringing back nothing at the minute. And this is my statement. And what that's going to do, it's going to turn that into um, actual data that I can then process. At the minute, it's not enabled. I've set it to run every minute, but when I enable it, it will start running that query every minute and pushing it through. I'm actually going to run it manually just to show you how it would work. Okay, so I am going to go into my data flows now. And we're going to have a look at our SRS invoice task. Okay, so I am going to actually disable some of these steps so we can see how it all runs as it gets transacted. So I'm going to just take, turn all them off and then I'm going to go through these manually through the um, actual process manager screen so we can see it. So the first one in particular is I'm going to split the invoices down into individual transactions. We are then going to call the SRS API, which I have already pre-dragged on. So from a second to load. Sometimes happens. Okay, I'll have a look at that. Um, well, this is my SRS um, asset. So it's running a produced document. The document type is an invoice, and this is what I am then kind of transacting on it. So again, all of this is documented here. So when you want to be able to replicate this yourself, it is available here as well. And then it chains on to get the invoice data. So once we've created the invoice, we need to actually get the invoice number. And I'm actually doing a splitter here. I'm actually writing the invoice to file, but I'm also going to email the invoice directly to the customer on record. So I'm actually able to do two things with that document at the end of it quite nice and seamlessly. So what I need to do is obviously go and put a new order on and dispatch it. So in whizzy quick fashion, I am going to go back through exactly the same process as I went through before. I'm going to add a line. I'm going to go into another A100 because it's my favorite stock code. You sell a lot of bikes. Yes, I sell a lot of A100s. It's, it's not many other things get sold. And let's just post that, so that, that through. And oops. And the button and hit dispatch note. And let's just do that now. And again, it'll print the dispatch note, dispatch note 39. And there it is, lovely. And we can close out there. So now we know my scheduler is going to be pulling this up if it was enabled. So that's our new order on. We've dispatched it in Cispro. Happy days. And I'm going to go off to my scheduler now and I'm just going to run. I get dispatch notes. So I don't, I'm not, it's not enabled at the minute. That's why it's not running every minute. I'm just going to run it manually hitting the play icon. So successfully executed. That's good. Hopefully we've got our first transaction. So you can see I'm disabled it, which is good. 
so we can see the input and see how that's now being transacted. So here's my data, which is fully enough the same data that I've got from my query. And I'm then basically splitting it into individual invoice dispatches. So I'm going to go into there and enable that. So we can see the next transaction in, tan in tandem. So there's my invoice 05. So this is now the action of calling the SRS API to print it. So exactly the kind of the format I showed you before when I did the manual one, except for the fact that I'm passing this XML in and I'm using a transformation to actually pull those values into the correct fields. So again, let's enable that, save it, go back to process manager. And we should see we're now going through the same process as before. It's called off to the SRS API, it's being queued. And when CISPR is happy, it will then run that process. So again, if I went off to my document queue, I'll see that it's processing or in this case completed, which means it should complete here. And we've gone off to the next step. So you can see where I'm going here now. It's not very exciting. I've got my output from that particular flow, which is happens to be my base 64 string and also a hex version of it as well if I needed it. And I'm going to do a SQL query now. So I'm taking it from the reprint table. And what I what I need from there is the invoice number because I want to be able to send the customer the invoice with the correct name, um, with the correct values, and put that into the subject of the title. And I also need to get the email from the record as well to make sure I'm sending it to the right person. So I'm doing a bit of extra lookup here before it processes on. So let's enable that. Um, back to process manager. Okay, and as I said, showed you before, I split that out to two transactions. So now we're creating two of the same transaction, but one is to email, one is to write the invoice. So the email one, probably a bit more exciting than writing the invoice out to a file. We can see here that I, um, I've got a subject, which I have translated here. So I've got my invoice, I've got my action. So again, if you have a look at my send email, when I'm running attachments, this is how I can do it. So before in, data, in other versions of data switch, you could only attach the contents of the kind of the XML inside it. Now you can attach files from the file system, which was which came through as an enhancement request from one of my consultants. Um, so you could you know you could attach your T's and C's, or you could output the file first and attach it, whatever you like. And you can also then attach the base 64 encoded string as well. And that will then create a PDF for you. So that is demonstrated in the documentation here for both elements. And you can see here, this is kind of how I've then generated it. So here's my big lovely string that means nothing when I read it as a person, but as a computer, it absolutely loves it. And then I'm emailing it to my KCBTG address. And I've put a very loose message in there. You could make that HTML message to pretty it up. But let's go ahead and enable that now and save it. So that should send it. The other one I need to look at is, so that should go through. The other one I need to look at is my writing my invoice out. So this is a bit more interesting if I go and do this way. It's going to output it to a file path. So again, this could be going to somewhere on your file system that can be looked up. You could put the company code in there. You could use the file browser to look at it. So it's a nice way to output the file as well. And I'm giving it a, a proper file name, which is my invoice and the invoice.pdf. So while I'm there, I should hit enable and push that through. So again, that is all documented here. So if you want to be able to use the file name and more importantly, the decoding the six, base 64 string, so you get an actual PDF at the back of it that is described there as well. So, so it's great because if you're doing auditing or if you've got a document management system that has a particular file path it needs, you want to keep track of all of that history, you've got that built in, you're automating that as well, aren't you? Correct. So where did I? So let me just see where I put that. Write invoice. Back your house. Oh, there we go. 
and the Unreal invoices. Um, okay, so there's my latest one, 549. That's my invoice. So that's been outputted by the SRS plugin. And finally, um, my email will come through. I just, because sometimes it takes a while to come through our, our, our spam filters, I just got one that I pre-made earlier, which shows you the very basic email that you get to your email address, which has the attachment. So very nice. So that's going to the customer and I've output it to the file. So I think that's quite a nice little powerful tool um, that we've added in. It that flow demonstrates some of the key features of you know, using the scheduler, using SQL, and it demonstrates the new plugin that we've enabled inside this version of Data Switch. So what do they achieve? Obviously, what I quite like about this kind of flow is it's triggerless. It's, it's running every two minutes, so it's getting any new data in there. Um, and it's not relying on a trigger to, to potentially fire and fail, for example, because it's running every minute, it'll then say, if, if, say for whatever reason, it didn't pick up the dispatch in the first run, it'll pick it up in the second run. So it's a lot less prone to error, in my opinion. Throughout the day, we're invoicing. So we're not waiting for the evening to do a batch run. Customers are getting the invoices throughout the day, which means they can potentially pay earlier, hopefully. Um, not that they ever will, but you know, at least you're then getting that into your account and you're recording that transaction earlier on. We're also reducing the load of the evening. So we're actually able to kind of, you know, invoice and not have, you know, let's say a thousand invoices go through the evening, which, you know, creates a lot of pressure on the server um, with all the transactions that are going through at the same time. So we're creating it, those transactions in smaller batches throughout the day. Um, as Darcy touched on, if you've got a document management system, it's enables us to easily integrate into that. We can we can pass that string as an API call to a document management system. We can output it to the file system for it to pick up. It gives you a lot more control, which I quite like. There's a full on audit history as well, because it's, it'll be in data switch. So you'll be able to see when that transaction was sent and if it's successfully sent. And if for, for some reason it failed to send, then you'd potentially get an error in data switch to rectify later on. So I quite like that element of it too. Now with, with, with all good magicians, I'm going to caveat how this kind of works. You've got to use CISPRO server-side reporting, but first off to use the SRS API. That's a constraint put on us by CISPRO, not by data switch. So you will have to enable that, which is part of the reason as customers transition to eight, we were encouraging people to go to server-side because of some of the benefits it can bring. Um, a lot of them are around Avanti, Espresso, but now also for this SRS API. Obviously, the performance of generating those documents is dictated by the SRS engine and not data switch. So the longer it takes for CISPRO to process an invoice, that's how long the process the transaction is going to sit in data switch doing. Um, so there's a few more caveats on, on, like that on the portal that I showed you before. So please do go on to that link and we'll send it out at the end as well. So that'll give you some knowledge of how to, um, to understand it more in detail. So hopefully that's a nice little the... walkthrough. We'll go on, Rossi. No, sorry, Nick, sorry to interrupt, but one, one of the things that I know this brings to the table that's been talked a lot, about a lot internally is just how you're no longer reliant on the Windows scheduler and you're not having to set that up on the server. So for any system admins where you're taking care of this, that's one less thing for you to manage. For anyone that's had to battle with setting that up and getting it running, you might want to take a look and see how this might give you an alternate option for getting documents out. Yeah, thank you for that option. That's one of Battling with the Windows scheduler is one of my one of my biggest pains because we all know if there's if there's multiple people logged on to the server at the same time, then there's a chance that Windows scheduler might not run because it can't log on itself. Um, it can it's it's harder to debug when it does fail, and it actually takes quite a while to set up those those tasks. I can actually set up this flow. Well, I've actually built it and it's in one of our template section. You can actually set up this flow within minutes. So you've got an invoicing flow um, in ridiculously you know, quick um, quick time compared to setting up a, a scheduler like that. Absolutely. So I've, not, I've not heard you moan about the Windows scheduler once, Nick. You've been so restrained about it. <laughs> <laughs> I try my best to restrain. But it's, Absolutely. It's not, it's not, it's not, one, it's not, one, not for me. When I, when I like to automate things through data switch, um, I'm like, why am I in this tool? I want to be doing it in data switch. And now I am. So I'm happy. I'm a happy guy now. That's it. It's recorded for posterity. Yes, exactly. And it is. 
it, it is a fantastic plugin, the SRS um, tool that's added into Cispro and the marrying of that with data switch does actually make life a lot simpler. Exactly. And I, I should I should say straight away, the SRS plugin doesn't do just invoices. It can do your factory documentation. Like I say, it can do audit acknowledgements. Um, there is a link on the portal to the Cispro help section about the SRS API and what it can actually handle. So there's a, you can do pretty much all the documents that you want in Cispro. There are a few limitations, a few documents that might not be there, but on the whole, it can do most of what you need. So do 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 check that out so you can understand it a bit better. But it's not constrained just to invoicing. Invoicing is just one of my bains because of the window shed to learn having to set that up. Um, Sounds good. good what else do we it. have? So let's move on. Sorry, getting too excited. So a few other notable improvements that we've added in. There's an Amazon plugin now, um, which allows you to connect to the Amazon Sellers API. So it allows you to pull down things like sellers reports and do other connections with, with Amazon. This is a licensed plugin because we've got some of our own costs involved with keeping it up to date. So um, if you are interested in connecting to Amazon through the API, then you will have to speak to your account manager on that one. Um, I wish I could keep everything free if I could. But we've got to cover some costs. Um, send email. Like I say, you can send emails from the file system, which you actually couldn't do before, amazingly enough. Um, so that's a nice little feature added in. Archiving is a big one. So a lot of people don't kind of realize the size of the XML in that you start getting from various subsystems and other systems. You know, you, you could be taking in, you know, megabytes of data in a single transaction and, and storing that in SQL to then worry about later on, when realistically you don't actually want to keep any of that data, you're just kind of storing it because we're, we're, we're all holders in our heart. Um, but we've never made it easy in data switch to archive it either. So we've actually added an archiving tool, which allows you to just turn on archiving and then set a the amount of records that you want to keep. And it will basically just do the process for you in the background and keep that database from growing to um, huge, enormous um, sizes. I saw a 400 gigabyte one the other day, which um, worried me a lot. Oof. Yeah. Um, so a few of the little things in the process. So from 5.5 onwards, we're trying to make the user experience a bit better. So you can, the column layout will restore when you come back into that process manager. So if you are peculiarly about which way you put your, where you put your columns, then that should be restored. Um, providing you on the same browser and PC. Um, there'll be additional enable disable buttons, so you don't have to do like I was doing a second ago, go to a screen to enable a transaction, you'll be able to do it from one place. And improving some of the advanced searches as well, so you can get even further into those searches um, under the hood. So a lot of usability improvements there. Okay, so going into version 5.1, so I'm hoping to release this in quarter four, probably, probably more middle to back end. And um, this is gonna include some more improved APIs and um, .NET 7 and our machine integration platform. So we're actually building a platform with, with a customer at the minute to try and um, or to work on how we can actually integrate machines into uh, the subsystems through data switch to simplify that whole task. So the first one I wanna talk about is our improved APIs. I talked about the authentication side now I'm talking about how to make it more natively, more developer friendly. So in the past, we relied on like almost two standardized APIs, which kind of made, you know, creating those kind of standards that was quite a bit foreign to other third party developers having to use the same API call to perform different tasks. So what we've actually done, we've split that up into a more friendly version. So you can use proper API verbs like get or post in your queries. And then the actual payload is just the payload itself. It's not including any other um, information like the description or like anything else. It's all, all, all in there for you. So that allows us to simplify some things and make it a bit more friendly for the, you know, the third party developer who isn't, so they don't even need to think, know they're talking to data switch. They're just talking to an, any other API. You can build them up really, really quickly. So better for developers. It will improve performance and it will be better asynchronous processing as well. So at the minute, the current API runs really quickly, but it's not necessarily, it's actually queuing them. So they're going through one at a time. So if you get 50 at the same second, you might actually get quite a long response time for that 50th transaction. So we're making that better. 
So .NET 7, um, obviously a big update for us as developers, but probably absolutely um, not that exciting for anyone else. But for me, very exciting. So obviously we've got to keep up with the, the Microsoft's latest releases, so a security patch and everything. Um, it should bring with general performance increases to data switch, and be less resource intensive. So it's not you know, clogging up your server and generally allows it gives us a few more bits of functionality into data switch going forwards, like some of the API stuff I showed you before. So we'll be moving to that framework um, in due course or for this 5.1 release. Now, the more exciting one is the machine integration platform we're building. So we've been speaking to you know, customers. We spoke to a, um, a hardware supplier called IFM and They've given us some you know, good pointers. They are a very, very good supplier, I should say, putting these sensors in, they're very knowledgeable. And we're looking at how we can then take the sensor information from their IFM sensors and take that through data switch, do some pre-processing on the data and then pass it off to something else like a like, like CISPRO mom, like CISPRO itself or any other kind of subsystem that we want. So we're starting with some of the more high level granular protocols that the sensors Kind of give off. So we're looking at MT Connect at the minute, and we're looking at MQTT, and we're also looking at WebSockets. So some of these will be completely foreign concepts to you, but just think of them as how the sensors interact with kind of the top level applications, like or top business applications. We'll then have data switch managing that. So we'll be bridging that data across into data switch, and then we'll be handling that. So we need to know, you know, if we're getting count data. Has the count changed from the last count that we received? And if it hasn't changed, then we don't actually need to do anything because nothing interesting has happened in that time frame. But if it has changed, then actually let's go and send that new count to mom so it can update your business analytics, update the count against the machine, or even post transactions into CISPRO. So we're now creating this little kind of middleman between our sensors and mom doing all that nice handling for you and giving you that kind of that flexibility to write your own micro processes that manage that data so that's also very nice you can you can even pass it into data switch so you see you've got a temperature sensor that you want to monitor we could be getting that information and you could set a parameter that says if it goes over a certain you know temperature there or goes below a certain temperature then please go use data switch to send an email to our engineers to warn them of such an event so we're building this little integration platform and it's all about connecting that top level sorry the the, the bottom layer to our top layer and um, business systems, which I think is gonna be you know, a, big, a big thing going forward for a lot of companies who want to automate these processes. So we're very, very much in the thick of building that now. Um, so I'm quite excited to be able to show you that soon. Um, and if you have got any interest in that, obviously do let us know after this webinar so we can talk further. Okay. Final little topic on my little agenda and where we were getting towards the end of this now is how do I go? So from our typical, so you, you probably know if you're going from date switch seven to date switch eight, what that process is, because we've been doing that for the past few years. But now how do I go from 4.1 to the latest version of five? So obviously I prefer that you have a sandbox and everything is mimicked into that sandbox. And then we upgrade the sandbox to the latest version, which gives you lots of time then to test and make sure you're happy. Now this isn't, as big a move as it was going from seven to eight, because all, all the database is still kind of very similar. And there are some changes, there are some functional changes, some framework changes, but obviously I want you to test and make sure your flows are going through. So depending on your experience with data switch, obviously we can offer services, but you know, as always, depending on complexity, the days may vary. So we, we, we've probably put around a two day approach into that. Or if you are very, very technical yourself, Obviously, we can you can get on. I can promote your customer on the portal to a version five customer, which will give you access to the downloads and to be able to do it yourself. Um, but that is only again if you're doing a sandbox and you're very, very, very confident. And um, alternatively, there could be a hybrid of the above, where our technical team just do the install upgrade for you, and then potentially then your developers then just do kind of the, the, the testing and everything else in between, and then. When it comes to the actual upgrade itself, again, our technical team just do that installation element for you, um, which would be obviously a nice little teamwork, which might cost a little less. 
Now, if you don't have a sandbox, then obviously I encourage you to set one up if you can, um, but I appreciate that could be quite costly. So you can run a much riskier production upgrade, but we would have to dedicate a lot more time to handholding to make sure that the transactions are going through. Like I say, it's not the same level as upgrade as seven to eight, but there is still risk involved with any upgrade to software to make sure your transactions are processing. So it could be a slightly bumpier experience if you are going to go straight into production. Or what I quite like to do is wait for a better opportunity. So if you're doing the Nexus per upgrade, you go from seven to eight, or even if you're doing a server migration, that, that's always a really good time to actually upgrade data switch at the same time and just do a tiny bit of testing and then go live on the server migration on the next version. And that way you've got less impact on production. So that's one of my kind of more preferred ways of doing it at the minute. And when the opportunity is right. So that's kind of obviously do speak to your account manager about the upgrade if you're interested. Um, we want to run a little poll now. See if any of the content today has influenced your decision to upgrade to the latest version um, of data switch. So please do, do fill in that poll. Excellent. Well, we've got about 19% that have voted. So the rest are busy looking for their mouse clicks. Almost halfway there. We're we getting there. We'll give it another few minutes and then we'll close the poll shortly. All right, closing the poll. Thank All right. You very much. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks everyone for actually engaging in that poll as well. There's a few that aren't quite ready for that and about 80% that actually voted are happy to move along, but the other ones are wavering between not quite enough. So we need to work harder to make sure it's uh, showing you value and the other one associated with the expense. So we'll definitely have to go back and revisit that. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, so I'll just kind of end this. So basically the portal is kind of our source of information. So please do sign up if you're not already on the portal. And I have also been, well, there's only a few on that at the minute, but we are, I'm trying to build templates. So quick start templates that allow you to download and import straight into data to switch. So from this list, you can go into your, you can download some CISPRO balance automation templates, which allow you to do from CISPRO onwards allow you to balance sales, things like sales orders, the cash book, do all your GL integrations all through data switch, which is again, me trying to eliminate the need for that Windows task scheduler. And the invoicing process that we talked today um, is also there. So you can download that and make a start on changing that, make it work for your business. And with that, there is a bit of documentation with the different caveats involved in doing that. So more information on the portal. You, if you're on version, you won't be able to see this so it's only for version five customers that can actually get onto or and access these templates um so again you need to upgrade first or get your your, your kind of um, record upgraded to get onto this lovely to have you guys all on today we'll catch you at the next webinar in about a month's time take care thank you all